When one looks out into the world of philosophy, it can seem intimidating. There are a multitude of different philosophical positions and views concerning the nature of reality and how it works. Though out of all of them, there has been one which has stood the test of time. This system is that as was taught by the scholastics. Scholasticism is not just some system of medieval philosophy that is stuck in the medieval age. It is a system that transcends the scholastics themselves, for it has its ultimate foundation in Aristotle. It was then later famously formulated by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and thrived for a couple centuries before it was revived greatly by the neo-scholastics of the later 19th to early 20th century. It is thus important that the modern man return back to the scholastics and not quibble with vain modern philosophy, which is as fleeting as morning dew on grass. When it comes to philosophy, one must have a deep grasp with logic, which is the art or science of reasoning. For if one errs greatly on logic, then his whole system falls in on itself. As St. Thomas remarks, a small error at the outset can lead to great errors in final conclusions. In fact, some of the greatest philosophical errors have occurred because man is too prideful to see if their arguments line up with proper logic. Let us then cover a brief introduction on scholastic logic, for with this firm and trustworthy foundation, the novice can begin to conceive the world with the proper philosophical outset. In the first lecture, we covered scholastic epistemology, which covers how man can obtain truth. We upheld the tradition of moderate realism, as was taught by Aristotle and St. Thomas. In today's lecture, we will focus on logic, although because logic is so expansive, I will not be able to cover everything. But if you want to study the topic further, I have included a bunch of scholastic manuals on logic in the description below. As a side note, if you'd like to support me, make sure to check out my new released merchandise which is based on our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Now put briefly, logic is the art or science of reasoning. It studies the certain principles and rules that make up rational arguments in order that these rational arguments may be true. Within scholastic logic, there is a distinction between formal and material logic. Formal logic deals with the various rules that must be assumed in order for man to reason. Think simply of the most fundamental law or rule that must be followed, the principle of non-contradiction. This principle, which shall be covered in greater depth, teaches that existence, or being, cannot be non-existence. For it would be a contradiction to say that existence is equal to non-existence. This fundamental rule or principle must be assumed in order that man can rightly reason in any argument that he may produce. Keep in mind that these rules not only regulate arguments that man makes, but also the external world around us. For an apple is never equal to a pear. An apple is only an apple, and a pear is only a pear. On the other hand, material logic deals with the actual substance of arguments. But differently, material logic focuses on the various ideas and judgments that make up an argument that we may form. For example, this common syllogism states, Premise 1. All men are mortal. Premise 2. Socrates is a man. Conclusion. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Thus, material logic deals with the relation of man and mortal as a concept or idea. Contrast this with formal logic, which deals with the formalization or structure of an argument. With this distinction being made, let us briefly cover the nature of man's intellect and how that transitions into the need for logic. In scholasticism, the intellect is a blank slate at birth and before any sensory experience. We are not born with innate ideas as Plato and Descartes maintained. Our minds are like a tablet on which nothing is written. The intellect is just waiting to be furnished with intellectual ideas, and this happens when our senses come into contact with the outside world. As the peripatetic axiom states, Nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. This axiom essentially means that all knowledge has its foundation in sense experience, but we are not limited to particular sense experience since we can build from particular ideas and move to universal ones through abstraction. Though man is not born with innate ideas, he is born with the five senses that are due to his nature. These are sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. With these five senses, man is able to experience the world outside of him. Each faculty of sense has a sense object, or that thing which it seeks. The sense of sight seeks color, the sense of touch seeks the tangible, the sense of hearing seeks the audible, etc. With all of these sensible objects that we receive in our mind, we form a complete image of the world around us, which is formed by our common sense, or sensus communis in Latin. 
such that when I see brown and feel a furry texture and hear a bark, my common sense forms this into a perceptible-like image of what I would later recognize as a dog. But even if my senses no longer sense these sensibles of brown or fur or a barking noise, my imagination can still recall this sense information. This sense information is formed into what is called a sensible image or phantasm. This phantasm or sensible image is particular or relates to that which is here and now. It is a material image that even animals like dogs have through their five senses. Now our intellect can be divided into the active or agent intellect and the passive or receptive intellect. The active intellect takes this sensible image that we perceive and abstracts or takes out of it an intelligible image that our intellect can understand. Essentially, the active intellect lifts this material sensible image and makes it immaterial and universal. For example, I may view a particular dog through my five senses. I can touch its fur. I can see that it's brown and fluffy. I may even hear its bark. All of these senses come together in the mind into one perceivable sensible image. My active intellect abstracts and takes out of this particular image the universal nature of dog. This universal nature of dog can be predicated or applied to any particular dog that I may see. Now there is one specific note that must be presupposed or apprehended if I am to understand this universal nature of dog. For by the fact that I abstract this nature of dog, it truly exists in my intellect. In order for me to understand this nature, it must exist and have being or existence. Thus the intellect first apprehends being in order to understand any nature and all of reality itself. Being is the most foundational and primary note of anything in reality, for all of which is in reality exists or has being. From this note of being which we apprehend, we come to knowledge of first principles. First principles deal with the relations of being and non-being. For example, I mentioned earlier the principle of non-contradiction, which just states, being is not non-being, or existence is not non-existence. This is a self-evident principle, for it is impossible to place it into doubt without therefore using the principle or leading oneself into an impossible position or situation, or reductio ad absurdum. For example, if I say that this first principle is false, I am using this principle, for whatever is false cannot also be true. Essentially, doubting any first principle leads to the destruction of knowledge. This type of argumentation in defense of this first principle is called indirect argumentation, for since this principle is self-evident, we cannot prove it in a syllogism, but we can oppose any other view that argues against the principle. Another first principle is that of identity. This principle states that being is being, non-being is non-being. This first principle could be seen as the positive of contradiction, for it affirms the identity of a thing. Finally, we find the principle of excluded middle, which states that there is nothing between being and non-being. This is essentially saying that there is nothing between existence and non-existence. A thing either exists or it doesn't. There is no middle course. Here we begin to find the basis or foundation of logic with these first principles. For as was stated, these principles must be assumed before one begins to form any syllogism or argument at all. Not only that, but these first principles influence and underlie all of reality. As Father Gergu Lagrange says, the first object known by our intellect is the intelligible being of sensible things in its primordial opposition to non-being. The first principles are laws of thought only because they are first laws of being and of reality. From the outset, it is utterly clear that reality cannot at once be reality and non-reality. It is also important to note that the view just presented is classically called moderate realism. It was famously formulated by Aristotle and carried down to the scholastics who furnished this tradition. This view of moderate realism is the perfect balance or middle course between two extremes. On the one hand, you have what is called sensism. This view generally limits our knowledge to the particular sense experience we encounter. Most famously, this view has been purported by men like John Locke and David Hume, who are empiricists. We agree with them on the mind being a blank slate and having reliance on the senses for our basis of knowledge, though we disagree with them on the concept of ideas being universal since they reject this proposition. 
The scholastics hold that our universal idea of a dog is applicable to every dog we may encounter, whereas senses, like Hume, see the universal of a dog as a mere collection of particular sense experiences that we have of dogs. Therefore, for the senses, the idea of a dog is material and limited to the here and now, whereas for the scholastics, the idea of a dog is immaterial and applicable to every dog we may encounter. On the other hand, we have the intellectualist tradition that puts more emphasis on knowledge that is prior to sense experience. We see this grow out of men like René Descartes, who founded the School of Rationalism. Descartes' famous phrase, I think therefore I am, is founded on the idea that this is a prior principle to sense experience. This type of knowledge can be called a priori or analytical knowledge, for it is supposedly prior to sense experience. The issue though is that this principle that Descartes puts forth assumes a multitude of other first principles like non-contradiction and identity. But these first principles assume sense experience and the apprehension of being or existence. Nonetheless, moderate realism stands out as the balance between these two philosophical views. Now, as we noted, our active intellect abstracts an intelligible or universal image from our sensible image in our imagination and hands this over to our passive or receptive intellect. Here then is where our intellect begins to reason in a general sense, for there are three acts of the intellect, simple apprehension, judgment, and reasoning. The first act of the intellect is simple apprehension. It is the process by which we grasp or understand an idea without affirming or denying anything of it. For example, my active intellect will abstract the idea of man from a particular sensible image of a man. Simple apprehension merely takes this essence or universal of man without affirming or denying anything of it, but merely apprehending the idea or concept of man, such that we are able to get the term man. This term will be vital for syllogisms which shall take place in the act of reasoning. The second act of the intellect is that of judgment, by which the mind makes the pronouncement on the agreement or disagreement of two ideas. To give an example, I may make the judgment that man is mortal, meaning he can die. The third act of the intellect is reasoning. This is the process by which the intellect compares ideas and judgments it has formed and reaches a new relation or idea or judgment. For example, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Here we have reached the syllogism, which was just given concerning Socrates. Each syllogism consists of two judgments or premises in order to arrive at another judgment, also called a conclusion. Essentially, a syllogism follows the same procedure as our intellect reasons. Now, there are multiple different types of syllogisms. The first is that of the categorical syllogism. It necessitates a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion that is contained within the premises, such that if the major and the minor premise are true, the conclusion necessarily follows. For example, in the syllogism given above concerning Socrates, the major premise comes first and has a more general or universal application, while the minor premise is more particular. For in the syllogism, the major premise is that all men are mortal. Now in the major premise, there is the major term. In this case, it is the term mortal. In the minor premise, we have the minor term, which is Socrates. The goal of the syllogism is to connect these two terms together in the conclusion, and this is done by the middle term man. For man connects the idea of mortal and Socrates together, and the conclusion reflects this. Though the middle term is never present in the conclusion, only the major and the minor term. Another kind of syllogism is that of the hypothetical syllogism. This syllogism has a hypothetical premise interladen within it, such that if something were the case, then it would entail a certain conclusion or result. To give an example of a specific type of hypothetical syllogism, if it rains, there will be no game. It rains, therefore, there will be no game. Now, when we are dealing with syllogisms of any kind, it is important to note that a syllogism has to be both formally and materially valid in order for the syllogism to be true. For example, a syllogism may be formally valid such that it is structured properly and all the propositions properly relate to one another, but it could be materially invalid such that the subject matter of the syllogism does not hold true in reality. To give an example, all men are immortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is immortal.
The syllogism is structured properly and is formally valid, but is materially false, since man is mortal, not immortal. And the same holds true if the syllogism is formally invalid, but materially valid. There are, of course, arguments which are not absolutely syllogistic in structure, but are irregular syllogisms. We find a lot of these types of irregular syllogisms in day-to-day -day speaking and in formal argumentation. It is important to note that each of these irregular syllogisms can be turned into a regular syllogism for clarity. The first irregular syllogism is that of the enthymeme, which is a shortened syllogism that excludes one of the premises. For example, Socrates is mortal because he is a man. Of course, in this example, the major premise is excluded, that all men are mortal, but the argument still follows. An epicurema is a lengthened syllogism, or one that has further proof or explanatory power in one of the premises. For example, all men are mortal because they are composed of corruptible matter. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Finally, we have the Sorites. This form of reasoning involves a series of connected premises that is arranged such that the predicate or term of one is the subject of the next. It essentially ends up forming a logical chain of judgments to arrive at a conclusion. So for example, Socrates is a man, every man is a rational animal, every rational animal is a living creature, every living creature is composed of corruptible matter, whatever is composed of corruptible matter is mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Finally, we can call out a syllogism for being formally invalid if the major and minor don't relate to one another, or materially invalid if the material of the argument doesn't relate to reality. But there are also some other means of refuting arguments. These are called fallacies, of which we shall only cover a few here. The fallacy of equivocation consists in using a single term in two different ways, and thus equivocating the two terms. For example, a Protestant arguing against a Catholic may falsely say, it is wrong to worship others than God, but Catholics worship others than God, for they worship the saints. Therefore, Catholics do what is wrong. The issue is the equivocation of the term worship, for in the major premise, it means paying divine honor to God, while in the minor, it means giving reverence, for Catholics do not pay divine honor to the saints when they worship them, but merely give reverence to them. The fallacy of begging the question involves assuming the conclusion or what you're trying to prove as already true in the argument. For example, Descartes argued that our intellect is trustworthy because God would not give us an intellect that deceives us. He then proceeded to use his intellect as a valid instrument to prove that God exists, but that begs the question. Another fallacy is that of a non sequitur. This happens when a conclusion is made that is not drawn from the premises of a conclusion as I described earlier. For example, Socrates is a wise philosopher, therefore all philosophers are wise. This is a non sequitur, for just because Socrates is wise and a philosopher doesn't mean everyone who is a philosopher is wise. One merely has to look at modern philosophy to see that this argument is not true. Thus, we have covered the very surface of scholastic logic, for as was stated, scholastic logic dives much deeper. But if you want to research more on that topic, I have included scholastic manuals on logic in the description below, so make sure to check those out. Nonetheless, may this tool of logic, which is the very art and science of reasoning, be a helpful guide in all that you do. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help support my work, consider sending in a donation through the links in the description below. As always, God bless.